Hello, everyone. My name is Lindsay Harrington. I got to intern this summer on the House Ways and Means Committee. My worldview and understanding of race was shaped by my experience in the child welfare system as a biracial individual who grew up in households whose racial backgrounds did not always represent mine, nor were they always sensitive to the challenges I would face as a woman of color in America. Because of this, it has laid the foundation for my interest in the impact of race in America. So a major crack that I see in the child welfare system is the disproportionate number of African American males who are waiting to be adopted and not being placed with loving families. I was drawn to this topic because of the cultural climate of America currently. One does not have to look too far or too long to see that society's perception of African American males is often a negative one. I know that this only hinders their advancement in society. I also know that African American males in the child welfare system deserve better. And while this cannot be entirely remedied through legislation, Congress certainly has a significant role to play in ensuring that African American males in the child welfare system have the same opportunities as others. We should not underestimate the impact that a forever family can have on an individual. With this in mind, I recommend that Congress makes three crucial policy changes. <coughs> Currently, the federal government's adoption and foster care analysis and reporting system, most commonly referred to as AFCARS, collects race, gender, and age information, but it does not analyze and publish this data in a way to account for the multitude of intersectional and categorical variables. For example, there are 50,000 children who were adopted out of foster care in 2013. There are 55,000 African American children in foster care, and there are almost 211,000 males in foster care. What we don't know is how many African American males were adopted, or for that matter, how many Caucasian females aged out. This lack of data hinders our ability to meet the specific needs of children by lumping them all into one category. I recommend that Congress requires HHS to collect this intersectional data. The Inter-Ethnic Placement Act, also known as IEPA, requires the development of recruitment plans by states for foster and adoptive families that are reflective of the child's ethnic and racial diversity. However, in my research, this recruitment effort is not being implemented everywhere, even though it has shown that black adults show the strongest preference for adopting African American children. I recommend that Congress require the Government Accountability Office, or GAO, to perform an in-depth report on the status of how IEPA's diligent recruitment requirement has been upheld in the African American community. And based on the report's findings, the federal government must mandate that states adhere to this law in order to receive their full federal child welfare funding. Lastly, I recommend that Congress call for a PSA campaign to help change the public opinion and negative narrative regarding African American males in foster care in need of adoptive families. In 2009, the federally funded and highly successful Adopt US Kids campaign focus on increasing adoption for African American children broadly. A focus on African American males specifically and their campaign could be the launching force that brings this issue to the forefront at the national level. The impact of race on our daily lives is powerful, whether we choose to interact with it or not. When a system is broken, we all feel its impact. The people in this room have the power to decide if we will invest in the front end of our system or the back end. And the consequences of how we address this pitfall makes the difference of African American males making up larger populations in our prisons, in our streets, or our colleges, in our Congress. African American males in foster care have a purpose. I want them to know that there are people on Capitol Hill who are fighting for them, who believe in them, and who will choose to fight for them even when it's hard. I believe that it's not only important, but time to address this population, this crack in the system. And I hope you will choose to not only feel the same way, but take action. Thank you. Well, I appreciate so much getting to be with all of you. You know, I just have sort of a special, there's Jeff Gerard. I'm sorry I didn't <laughs> have such a, a good feeling to, to be among you because I know that this is a group that has a great deal of humanity in their own hearts and that their purpose for being here is to try not only to, to make a better future, but to touch hearts that may not uh, have that opportunity otherwise. And I'm grateful to all of you just for who you are and what you, you try to do. And you know, I think you're heroes in my heart. Uh, Lindsay, I was a, 
uh, especially touched by some of your words, and I, I want you to know that uh, you are right. There are a lot of people here that want to do good things, and sometimes we just need to be informed. And I have to say to you that the 12 of you here, I think, could easily underestimate um, how important your part of it really is. Because in a sense, with Congress, you know, it's all about have, trying to create an intent on their part and then the ability to work with it, the capacity that they have available to them to make the difference. And you guys, in a sense, do both. Because every issue we deal with, whether it's insurance or national security or whether it's business or what, all the issues we deal with, we always try to bring the constituents in, you know, the ones that the issue affects the most. And I don't know why we don't apply that like we should to foster youth and other things. We should hear from you because you're the ones that are affected most by the policies that we have. So you have a, an insight and a direct experience that none of us can, can possibly replicate no matter how much uh, ability to discern things from the outside that we have. We can never be you. Uh, and so you, you bring the facts to the table that are so very important to us. And I think it's important that members of Congress interact with you. And I have to tell you on the second front, and that's just this intent, this this um, uh, touching the, the member's heart. And uh, I've uh, worked in children's issues most of my adult life. I had the privilege of being the, the head of the children's department in Arizona years ago. And so this is not something new to me, but I'm, I'm always uh, moved by the stories of young people like you because somehow it makes it real. And, you know, that's the great challenge in such an environment as we are in. We just don't really have a real picture of what really is happening. But your personal testimonies touch people like me and other uh, policymakers like nothing else in the world. And I hope you don't grow weary in trying to come all the way up to Washington and try to get all of us maniacal members of Congress straightened out sometimes. But we, we, I do appreciate it. I appreciate it. And I think sometimes it's easy for you to forget not only how you affect this process and not only how your insight informs people like me uh, and moves the hearts of people like me, but you sometimes might forget that all the heartaches that you've had might, might prevent a lot of people from having to go through the same thing. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes we, we don't understand when we go through difficulties why it has to be that way. Uh, I suppose that's something we won't answer on this side of the, the councils of eternity. But I am convinced this much that when we get beat down in life, we really have two, two options. We can let it make us bitter and, and we can feel sorry for ourselves and some of us, some of us do that on a regular basis. But uh, we can make ourselves you know, sort of feel uh, negative about it. Or we can say, you know, I'm going to try to turn this thing into something good that will help other people. And it has two effects. Number one, it helps other people. You know, all, only the eternity is going to discover the impact you guys have. But number two is it somehow encourages our own spirit, our own issues. You know, I was reading a passage there uh, the other day with a, uh, a, the lady that uh, wrote the uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. And she lost her little baby. And it just broke her heart in the worst kind of way. She, she prayed that somehow this great tragedy uh, would, Harry Beecher Stowe, it would somehow, it would, it would, make her be able to be used of God to do something for others. And look what she did. Wow. So I don't want you to underestimate for a moment uh, what your presence means to people like me and what it means to the future. I think uh, Daniel Webster said it like this. He said, if we work on marble, it will perish. If we work on brass, time will face it. <coughs> if we rear up temples, they will crumble into dust. But if we work upon immortal minds, that's all of you and, and your contemporaries, and imbue them with principles, with the just fear of God and love for our fellow men. We engrave on those tablets something that will brighten and brighten to all eternity. So my final word to you is, when you're here and share your stories and move the hearts of policymakers to come up with uh, things that will help prevent heartaches for others and let them walk on a higher, sunnier place of life, you're not only affecting now, but uh, you are doing something to brighten all of eternity. So God bless you and thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for taking the time out of your day to hear about the various issues that are prominent in the arena of child welfare. 
I would like to give a very special thank you to Senator Wyden's office for hosting me this summer. My name is Angelique Salazan, and I'm a recent graduate of Binghamton University. A huge factor of my recent success is due in part from having an educational vocational specialist. I was placed into the foster care system at the age of five because of my parents' substance abuse to alcohol, heroin, and cocaine. Throughout my time in the school system, I was very angry and hurt, and it showed through my schoolwork. It wasn't until I got to middle school and I was introduced to Elise Gelbman, the educational vocational specialist at Good Shepherd Services, that I realized that if someone cared about my academic success so much, then so should I. I truly do believe it was mainly because of her that I sit before you all today, not only as a college graduate, but as a young professional. I have known Ms. Gelman for 10 years, and in those 10 years, she has helped me assess my challenges, interests, passions, in the midst of emotional turmoil. Even when both of my parents passed away while I was in high school, Ms. Gelman didn't give up on me, even when I wanted to give up on myself. She was always on top of her job, collecting my attendance, school records, keeping in contact with my school district, and keeping me at the forefront of my academic future, to not let the past determine where I, the places I saw myself going. She guided me with finding internships, <coughs> advocacy opportunities, applying to schools, navigating financial aid services, and giving me the pros and cons of the decisions I was planning to make. The strides she has made has motivated me to not only excel academically, but to also give back to my community and educate foster youth like myself that there is a way to cope with the trauma, and that way may very well be through education. There are approximately 250,000 school-aged children in the foster care system. Only 50% of them will graduate high school, and only 3% three of, three of them will attain a bachelor's degree. This is a cause for concern, because many of them will experience homelessness and will have to depend on other federally funded programs in order to survive. Every year, 26,000 people age out of the foster care system, and between public assistance, incarceration, and assorted community costs, on average, will cost taxpayers $300,000 per person, and in total, $7.8 billion annually. I propose that the federal government consider my recommendations to amend the Fostering Connections to Success and Increasing Adoptions Act of 2008 to require one educational vocational specialist per child welfare agency to serve as a foster youth's designated point of contact. To continue, as a condition to receive federal child welfare reimbursement under Title IV-E, requires states to designate one educational vocational specialist in each child welfare agency. This will close the gap between child welfare and education agencies and prevent more youth from falling through the cracks. Just a few weeks ago, the Senate passed the reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965, otherwise known as ESCA, which included a foster care amendment to address the need for a direct point of contact in local education agencies who is in correspondence with child welfare agencies. While this is a step in the right direction, the responsibility needs to be placed on child welfare agencies to be accountable for the foster youth's educational stability and not the local education agencies. Education is one of the many tools foster youth can utilize in order to create stability that they long for. The youth are our future, and if the government is supposed to be the ones in place of our parents, there needs to be more done to ensure that foster youth have the chance to excel. Thank you. Angelique is a tough act to follow. <laughs> Suffice it to say, she was considered a star in our office of this summer. So Angelique, thank you again for being a good role model for a wonderful program, the Finance Thank Committee you. is very, very pleased to have worked on this uh, program for some time, and we really appreciate your continuing our legacy of, uh, of public service. I'm going to make this a filibuster-free zone, folks, and be real brief. I see my colleague, Senator Blunt, is, uh, is here, and uh, I will just tell you, too often, policy is made here in the halls of the Congress without really consulting those who are most affected by those policies. There are now more than 400,000 children living in foster care. 
about 8,000 of them in my home state. And my view is, and that's why it's so good to have all of you, I'm just looking down the road, all this young uh, talent here, it would just be legislative malpractice for the Congress not to listen to what young people have to say on these issues. So that's why it is so good that all of you are here. And that's why the Congressional Coalition on Adoption and their Institute for Foster Youth Internships uh, is so incredibly important. We hope all of you have had a really exceptional uh, summer. And please know that your hard work is not just benefiting yourself, but it's going to benefit the entire uh, country. You've helped us to contribute to the discussion about child welfare, adoption, and foster care. And I also want to add that probably one of the areas I have been most excited about in my time in public service, I came to the Congress as a pretty young guy, had a full head of hair and rugged good looks and all of that, uh, that kind of thing. And we helped to get something started called kinship care, where in effect we gave the first priority for services for vulnerable kids and vulnerable families to, say, a grandparent or an uncle who might want to step in and spend a few years nurturing that youngster. And we're still doing that. So you all may think that uh, after your stint here on Capitol Hill, we're going to let you out and kind of liberate you. But we're going to be asking your opinion on the kinds of issues I mentioned, adoption and foster care and kinship care, because we ought to build on those uh, programs. Now, I know all of you have spent a lot of time here, six weeks on policy research. I, I guess you just have something called a resume boot camp. And, uh, <laughs> probably something I ought to uh, go to. <laughs> and suffice it to say, while I hope that you all enjoyed a lot, there is no question um, in my mind that this uh, program this is one that we need to grow in the years ahead. Angelique has already told her story. Angelique, I'm sorry I got tied up. The, it's okay. The Democrats and Republicans have a special program at lunch where we go over our business, but I'm going to tell you to tell me the part of the story that I missed um, you know, earlier. But suffice it to say, Angelique wants the system to go beyond ensuring the basic safety of kids and also focus on the educational success, the educational opportunities for foster youth. So Angelique, it seems to me what you and your colleagues here are doing is performing a great service by emphasizing that the basics are important, but we can do more than the basics because of this incredible talent pool that we have up here. So I am looking forward, Angelique, to reviewing your policy uh, paper. I will tell Thanks. you, and I'll, I'll wrap up, that Angelique's idea, like many that we've had before from the internship, not only get debated, I see Mr. Sullivan uh, here in the front row, he can tell you about this. He was the staff director of the Finance Committee for a number of years. A lot of the ideas that we get from this group don't just get debated in the Senate Finance Committee where child welfare legislation goes, but they often morph into legislation and often end up with a public law number. So you haven't just been involved with a writing uh, exercise. You are giving us an example of how to take a good idea from people who are mostly uh, affected, young people. Give us your input and insight and help us come up with policies that are good for the country. So thank you all for all the good work you've done with this wonderful uh, program. I'm glad I got a chance to see uh, the All-Stars here in Technicolor, but I will tell you, I think this program is on the right side of history. And as long as I have the opportunity to serve Oregon in the United States Senate, I will do everything with my colleagues and everything I possibly can on a bipartisan basis to grow this wonderful program and take your ideas and turn them into policy. Thanks, everybody. Congratulations. Thank you.
I don't say this often, but I agree with everything Senator Wyden said. <laughs> Every opportunity I find I could say that, I probably should. Actually, I think he and I are both on the way to the uh, Intel Committee. We, we served together on that committee to uh, talk about the, the Iran agreement. We're going to have some briefings on that today. But I am pleased to be here with you, and uh, Senator Wyden already did cover a lot of the things that needed to be uh, covered. We've been so pleased to have Jen align with us this year. Uh, we've had really three great foster interns over the last three years. Uh, R.J. Sloak uh, was our first uh, foster intern. We got some legislation actually uh, passed when R.J. was here because he had started the, I think, the high school civics class and others like four different times. We got an uninterrupted uh, scholars law passed that he got a chance to work on. Uh, um, Jane uh, Crinky is the sort of the resident assistant keeping everything going for this year's group, and she was a great part of what we did in our office uh, last year. And then Jen has really worked hard on uh, an issue that I'm generally concerned about, mental health and the application of mental health, how we deal with those issues, how we deal with mental health issues, uh, exactly the same way we deal with all other health issues. There's no reason to have a differentiation. There's no reason to assume that this isn't part of, of everybody's health concern. And so what Jen did, uh, for me was look at what the Social Security was doing, uh, both with the, uh, the access to mental health services for people who were dependent on Social Security as, as, their, uh, as their means of, of, of living, uh, and also to look at the placement issues uh, and to ensure that mental health became part of that, that placement uh, and a quick review, uh, not quick in terms of the review itself, but quick access uh, to a review so that you're really dealing with the whole person in a way that uh, makes this a part of understanding who we are and who you are. And so those are really big issues. Jen's moved us a long way uh, in that direction. We continue to benefit uh, from this program. Uh, three great interns already looking forward to who our intern will be next year and looking forward to taking the work, uh, the things that I've learned from the interns we've had and continue to look for legislative and oversight solutions uh, to problems that, frankly, this program uh, does a lot to help us understand. So thank all of you for being here, Jen. Thank you particularly, uh, and thank you for letting me be here today. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Matthew Broderick, and I'm from the great city of Little Rock, Arkansas. My five siblings and I were born and raised in a strict religious cult where physical and mental abuse was the way of life. It was a community living place in which all rules were dictated from the leader in his interpretation of the Bible. He claimed to hear directly from God and not adhering to his rules was considered direct disobedience to God, resulting in hellfire damnation. All connection to the outside world was severed. We did not have any access to internet and any music or reading materials had to be submitted to screening by the leader, otherwise it was considered contraband. If you were caught with contraband or violating any of his rules, you were punished. For children, punishment was usually being beaten, slash abused, both physically and mentally, generally in public, which happened to both me and my siblings on several occasions. The FBI later raided the cult in 2008 and removed all the children and placed us into various foster homes. I was blessed to end up in a great home in a loving foster family. My foster family helped me realize that I could chase my dreams and that I could be a success. I'm the first in my family to graduate high school and college, and in two weeks I'll begin, William H. I'll begin law school at William H. Bowen School of Law in Little Rock. For the past six weeks, I've had the privilege and opportunity to intern in Congressman Mark Wayne Mullen's office, and I'm very grateful for the time he, his wife, his staff spent investing in me and exposing me to the various aspects of the office, and above all else, the time they took to get to know me. Being here in the great nation's capital, I have had the amazing opportunity to speak for children who have been victims of unfortunate circumstances and are learning to live with their past. My little sister was one of these children. She was placed in a strict group home that did not allow children much freedom to be normal. She was prescribed psychotropic medication that completely altered her personality and caused her to be in a constant, sad, zombie-like state with suppressed emotions, which was frightening. Sadly, my sister is far from alone. Each year, as many as 481,000 foster children may warrant mental health services, and healthcare professionals may not be fully aware 
of an individual foster child's trauma background and also may not be trained or equipped to treat the foster child who experienced extensive trauma. My doctor told me directly that she had never had a case like mine and could not imagine what I was going through. As a result, psychotropic medications are too often relied upon as a primary solution for behavioral issues without proper screening or comprehensive treatment plan. Children in foster care prescribe psychotropic medications at about nine times the rate of the general population in child welfare. Of the children in foster care that are prescribed psychotropic medication, nearly 50% are prescribed two or more in the same year, often at times concurrently. Federal law currently only offers minimal guidance to address this problem, but does not elaborate on how this should be accomplished. Although several states have taken great steps towards addressing this issue, there is need for more congressional action. I recommend that Congress require the development of a comprehensive treatment plan before the prescription of psychotropic medication to foster children. This comprehensive treatment plan must consider a therapeutic treatment first before medication and must also be communicated between the youth, guardian, welfare agency, and trauma-informed healthcare experts. They must also require that if a psychotropic medication is determined to be in the best interest of a foster child and prescribed, the prescription must undergo a secondary review by an independent agent in the state to verify that the prescription is appropriate. Cong Congress should implement these changes so that foster children who, like my sister, find themselves facing circumstances over which they had no control will receive appropriate personalized treatment to better equip them for a successful future. Thank you. My name is Eric Barris, and I'm from Trout Creek, Montana. When my biological mother married my stepfather, my life took a turn for the worse. I was physically abused on a daily basis to the extent that I missed multiple weeks of school every year because my wounds had to heal. My parents and my family of origin were drug dealers as well as addicts. I had four younger siblings that I had to take care of because my parents were absent most of the time. After more than a decade of coming home and seeing my parents strung out with drug paraphernalia <coughs> throughout the house, I got sick of it and called the police on my mother. I was just 14 years old when my siblings and I went into foster care. I was considered a hard to place child because of my gender and age, so unfortunately I was placed in group homes. I was put in group homes that felt more like a warehouse than a home. They housed 20 or more children at a time. The group homes had an unwelcoming, harsh, institutional feel with their policies and procedures on the walls. With constant staff turnover and shift care group homes, youth are not able to learn to trust and build relationships. There were level systems that dictated whether I could do simple things like take a walk outside. These level systems set children up to fail and prevented them from attaining any sort of normalcy. I felt lost in the system, punished for being placed in foster care. Open Gate Ranch was my last placement. It is a family group home that is run by Becky and Craig Barris. They provide a loving home to a maximum of eight boys at a time. They live in the home with the boys 24-7, which helps to build trust and bonds. Becky and Craig are always there for us. We do things as a family. We go on family vacations, we go camping, fishing, celebrate holidays, especially birthdays. Now you know why I chose to be here as a foster youth intern this summer, to advocate for family group homes. Of all the children that are placed in group home settings, 74% are teenagers, and teen boys are 29% more likely than girls to be placed in group homes. Congress and the administration have shown considerable effort in reducing group homes. In the last 10 years, federal and state governments have actually reduced group homes by 37%. However, I believe that family group homes should be considered family-based care, although this is not the current standard. I recommend, first, that Congress responsibly encourage family group home placements over large group homes and institutions. This could be achieved through Title IV-E reimbursement requirements such as justification for family group home placement through a diagnostic assessment that family foster care placements have failed in the past. Congress could, allow, could also require continued biological family reunification efforts or continued family foster care placement efforts if the youth is not progressing in the family group home. Secondly, based on those accountability measures, Congress should allow Title IV-E reimbursement for outcomes-based contracts for family group homes that serve teen boys who are likely to age out of care. Lastly, I believe that Congress should ensure that family group homes are categorized as a preferred placement on provider lists over non-family group home and institutional placements 
for hard to, te hard to place teen boys. For further explanation of how to responsibly encourage family group homes, please see my recommendations on page 28 of the report. As I mentioned, teen boys are the hardest foster youth to place. Consequently, teen boys are the most likely to end up in group homes. I was one of those hard to place teens who went from group home to group home. I thank God that I was finally given my chance at normalcy through my placement at Open Gate Ranch, a family group home, and ultimately my adoption. Now I am going on to get my master's at Brigham Young University in the fall. I believe that other teen foster youth across the country could also benefit from the same normalcy that family group homes gave me. I would like to thank the Senate Finance Committee and Becky Shipp for giving me un an unforgettable experience this summer. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experience and policy recommendations. I would like to thank the esteemed members of Congress and their staff for taking time out of their day to join us here today. My name is Kenya Adiola, and this summer I had the pleasure of, of interning in the office of Senator Tim Scott of South Carolina. <coughs> I am not supposed to be here today, or at least that is what the statistics say. I was not supposed to be here today presenting to members of Congress about the recommendations of the foster care system. I am not supposed to be here today because of the 80% of former foster youth who decide to go to college, only 10% even enroll. So I am an exception because not only was I a part of the 10% that enrolled, but I was accepted and I graduated in May. Only 3% of foster youth graduate from college. The remaining are more inclined to face poverty, homelessness, incarceration, and struggles with drug and alcohol abuse. More than 71% of former youth, foster youth who do not possess a college degree make less than $25,000 a year. And this is why today I want to emphasize that one's life can be greatly affected by educational choices. The majority of foster youth do not succeed from graduating from college because of financial limitations. I can attest to the financial difficulties a foster youth may face as a consequence of wanting a college education. It took me six years of continuous education to graduate. I worked over 40 hours a week and took over 18 credit hours a semester. I worked to supplement the $5,000 that I received from the educational training voucher. <coughs> and because of this extra burden, I failed a number of classes. I struggled a lot without the support I needed because I didn't have the proper financial and, and emotional support. I considered dropping out, but in spite of everything, I persevered. Unfortunately, not everyone is so lucky. In order, in, in order to limit and prevent heavy economic reliance on welfare programs, it is important that foster youth aging out of the foster care system receive additional funding in order to obtain a bachelor's degree. Here is what we need to do. I recommend that Congress offer partial reimbursement for states that provide full tuition waivers for foster youth and demonstrate improved foster youth graduation rates. States like Massachusetts and Florida offer full tuition waivers for foster youth attending public in-state universities. Programs like these were created in order to help counteract the rise in tuition prices as well as the decline in the availability of federal dollars. In 2008, 17% of foster youth were enrolled in Massachusetts colleges and universities. And during that same year, in California, only 2.4% were enrolled. Full tuition waivers will help eliminate financial insecurity, which plays a large part in the reason why foster youth do not enroll in college. I also recommend that Congress increase the amount of funding per year for the educational training voucher from $5,000 to $15,000 for each foster youth completing a bachelor's degree in order to cover expenses such as housing. Although paying tuition is a large part of attending college, many youth need a stable housing in order to attend school. The average cost of a college dorm room is $9,800 a year. It has been reported that 31% of foster youth experience homelessness after emancipation. Increasing the ETV amount will allow foster youth to afford housing fees and will put them in a stronger place in, to graduate. 25% of foster youth will end up in the criminal justice system within two years of emancipation. The average cost of incarceration per year is $30,000. This means that it is 300% more expensive to ho house a foster youth in a prison cell in a college dorm room. Foster youth by nature who attend college are predisposed to many negative outcomes that can be discouraging for a college degree. However, homelessness should not be one of them. An increased ETV will represent an investment in the bright future of those who have not been afforded the opportunity of a college education. 
My biggest hope is for Congress to make college more affordable for all eligible foster youth so that they too can overcome their circumstances and become influential leaders and contributors in their communities. Thank you very much. chills. I mean, I tell you what, we're, we're so thankful to be a part of the program, to be supportive of the program, to see how much potential we have locked inside young people. I'll tell you that your story was moving and, and heartwarming. I, I was thinking to myself that you too can be a U.S. Senator and perhaps President of the United States. I know that you're, yeah, she's going to go to China to, to teach kids English, so Konnichiwa. Of course it's Japanese and not Chinese. <laughs> CCI Foss Youth intern from Hawaii, and I interned in Senator Brian Schatz's office. I would now like to share with you a piece of my story. Growing up, I frequently witnessed domestic violence and the abuse of drugs and alcohol. I was 13 years old when my four siblings and I entered into the foster care system. During this time, I began to grieve for all the loss in my life. I was separated from my siblings, my mother had abandoned me, and I did not have a father figure to turn to because when I was three years old, he committed suicide. The pain that I felt inside was brought up to the surface, creating visible scars for life. I turned to drinking alcohol and self-harm to cope with my pain. And sadly, I am not alone. According to the Center for Disease Control, nationally, approximately 157,000 youth ages 10 to 24 are treated in emergency rooms for self-harm injuries, and approximately 4,600 youth in the same age group take their lives each year. Although I was unable to find the number of FOSS youth who committed suicide each year, studies have shown that youth with a history of time spent in care are two to six times more likely to attempt or follow through with suicide. The loss, isolation, and lack of support associated with entering into the foster care system are all risk factors for suicide. At the age 15, I was introduced to the Hawaii Foster Youth Coalition and Kids Hurt to Hawaii. They became my ohana, my family. Through these organizations, I have the opportunity to share my story, build healthy relationships with my peers, and receive training on grief and trauma. I'm able to understand triggers associated with experiencing trauma and the use of coping mechanisms in order to heal from my past. Having the training and peer support network helped me succeed. 
I never thought having a future was ever an option, but I'm proud to say that I'm currently attending college, pursuing a degree in social work. Unfortunately, not all foster youth have access to what I have. In 2010, Erwin Sellis from Hawaii committed suicide six months after aging out of the foster care system. I heard of Erwin's story through friends who knew of him. In order to, pre to prevent tragic outcomes like Erwin's, Congress should amend two sections of the John Chafee Foster Care Independent Living Program. My first recommendation is to amend the preventative health activities section of the Chafee Program to include an age-appropriate trauma-informed curriculum to address the basic concept of trauma, risk factors for self-harm and suicide, and protective factors that can reduce the risk for suicide. By understanding the link between trauma and suicide, foster youth will be able to cope with their painful memories in a positive and engaging way. My second recommendation is that I would like to amend the personal and emotional support service of the Shafee program to acknowledge and encourage peer-to-peer -peer support groups as an additional source of support. Peer-to-peer -peer support groups can serve as a protective factor ensuring connectedness as it can decrease the likelihood of developing suicidal behaviors. Congress should amend these two sections of the Shafee program because it will ensure foster youth who are exiting out of care to have access to more tools and support in order to build a solid foundation for a successful, for a successful transition into adulthood. Please help me protect foster youth from suicidal thoughts and behaviors because every life matters. Mahalo. I am a product of rape. My name is Ashley Williams and I was born a child destined to fail. Born to an unstable and abusive drug addicted mother and a father I would never know. When I left my mother's home and entered the foster care system at the age of 11, I thought I had escaped abuse and instability. I bounced between 36 different foster homes and attended over 26 schools and was molested for eight years throughout my time in care. I thought things were going to be better, but instead, I found myself in the same situation. I initially believed the foster care system would take me from a harmful environment and place me into a safe home. I trusted that my life would change for the better, but in reality, the molestation and physical abuse I experienced in my early childhood only continued. Instead of the perpetrators being my mother and her numerous girlfriends and their sons, it was now foster dads and foster brothers. Again. I had been set up to fail, only this time by the foster care system. After developing trust with my caseworker, I confided in him, and he accused me of provoking my perpetrators by the way I dressed. Given this response from my caseworker, I decided at the age of 11, I was alone, and my support system had failed me. Unfortunately, I am one of many. You see, in 2013, the number of self-reporting cases by alleged victims decreased by roughly 4,000 allegations from the previous year. Sadly, it seems that the child victims are falling silent. This is unacceptable. I find it ironic that the system designed to protect me from abuse only created further barriers and obstacles for me to report the abuse. See, this is a problem. Currently, each state has a different definition of maltreatment, as well as a different process for documenting child sexual abuse. For example, Arizona requires a written report every time an oral report of sexual abuse has been made. In contrast, Kansas requires a written report only when requested by the agency that received the initial report. Data is being collected, but not analyzed around sexual abuse in foster care. And even though the data is being collected, it is voluntarily provided by the states and is skewed due to my reasons mentioned previously. There is a lack of data on sexual abuse in the foster care system, and currently the Child Abuse and Provision Act, also known as CAPTA, provides funds for the investigation of child abuse and neglect in the foster care system, as well as providing data collection. But despite this, there is no national standard for what must be reported by states. In addition to inconsistent reporting criteria, the reporting options that do exist tend to vary, and there is a lack of third-party review. For example, not all states have a foster youth ombudsman that is independent of the child welfare agency. Most times, the offices are shared among the child welfare agency, which leads the offices investigating themselves. Therefore, I recommend improving existing avenues for reporting sexual abuse for foster youth in the following two ways. First, ensuring foster youth have access to an autonomous foster youth ombudsman. 
and are also made aware of any 24-7 hotlines and anonymous reporting. Second, require that every foster youth upon entry receive age-appropriate training on sexual education and avail available reporting options. And finally, tie the cap to funding to a standardized definition and criteria for reporting child sexual abuse. You see, I believe that had these recommendations been in place and had I been properly equipped when I entered the foster care system, I may have been able to avoid the 47 unwanted sexual encounters that I experienced in the foster care system. Thank you for allowing me to share my experience, and I just want to say thank you to a couple of people. I want to thank Representative Karen Bass for allowing me to have this opportunity this summer. I want to thank Team Bass, who is here to support me today. I want to thank my policy advisors, Misty and Margaret, and as well as my Sarah Start Fund mentors, uh, Lindsay, as well as Zephyrny. And I just want to say thank you to CCAI for this opportunity that I had this summer. Good afternoon, my name is Marcia Hopkins, and I interned this summer in Senator Casey's office. And I'd like, I'd like to talk to you today about foster youth homelessness. First, I would like to share a quote from Jackie, a former foster youth who experienced homelessness one year after aging out of care. When I turned 21, I was no longer eligible for the transitional living program. I became homeless because I did not have a plan B. I met Jackie as a graduate student, assisting her in securing employment and education services. It is because of her story I'm here today asking Congress to address barriers to homelessness for foster youth. Jackie grew up in foster care and did not find permanency or a family before aging out. With her belongings in hand, Jackie was forced to enter into adulthood without housing, employment, education, or guidance. Jackie is one of the many Excuse me. Jackie is one of the 23,000 foster youth who age out of care every year and experience homelessness due to the lack of resources and support. As a former foster youth and transitioning young adult, I understand some of the challenges that Jackie has faced. As a graduate student, I was unable to pay my bills and secure housing on my own. Unable to take full-time employment, I relied heavily on my family for assistance. However, unlike Jackie, because of my support system, I was able to sustain my housing and finish my master's degree. Today, thousands of youth continue to experience homelessness. The United States Interagency Council on Homelessness estimates that one quarter of foster youth will experience homelessness within the first four years of leaving care, with a vast majority of these youth excluded from services as they are less likely to live in shelters or on the street, but instead living with friends, doubled up, or couch surfing. As a result, I'm asking Congress to pass the Homeless Children and Youth Act of 2015, which would amend the McKinney-Vento Homeless Assistance Act to redefine the terms of homeless, homeless individual, and homeless person. Other efforts to prevent barriers to the age-out process for foster youth come from fostering connections to success and increasing Adoptions Act of 2008. Fostering Connections requires social service agencies and caseworkers to develop a transition plan outlining options for housing, health insurance, education, and other services in a 90-day period before, youth, before a youth turns 18 and allows 30% of Chafee funds to provide transitional housing for foster youth until 21. However, despite these efforts, extending foster care until 21 has not been found to prevent youth homelessness. I believe Congress should amend fostering connections to require child welfare agencies to provide a detailed housing plan and a specific transition strategy for securing housing for foster youth aging out of care, as no young person under the responsibility of the state should ever have to face homelessness. Thank you for your time. Good afternoon, thank you for being here. My name is Serena Spataro Haynes and I'm a Master of Social Work with an emphasis in public child welfare. Um, I interned in Senator Johnson's office this summer. I was also a foster child for 14 years in Wisconsin. When I was seven years old, I was not prepared for supervised visitation with my biological mother who has paranoid schizophrenia. 
My sister and I struggled to make sense of the symptoms of our birth mother's illness, such as delusions and hallucinations, with little support, let alone specialized services tailored to our unique needs. My goal in coming to Capitol Hill was to highlight best practices for supervised visitation between foster children and parents who have serious mental illness. Children of parents with serious mental illness have a 30% chance of developing one themselves and a 55% chance of developing any mental illness. I have always feared for my mental stability due to my gen genetic vulnerability. I expected to find new developments in public child welfare when I began the Title IV-E Public Child Welfare Training Program last fall. After working in a child welfare agency, I realized that due to large caseloads and a lack of resources, it is impractical for social workers to be able to meet the specialized needs of foster children coping with parents who have a serious mental illness. As an intern, as I was an intern, a seasoned social worker looked to me to help her understand serious mental illness after learning about my childhood experience. I was shocked this summer when numerous experts in the field of public child welfare and mental health stated that there are no supports that exist for this population. There are 13 million people who suffer from serious mental illness in the United States. Despite not knowing how many of these individuals are parents, we do know that 70 to 80 percent of mothers with serious mental illness lose custody of their children. Professionals would benefit from knowing how many foster children have parents with serious mental illness in order to know the extent of the need. If this information exists, myself and others interested in developing evidence-based practices will have basic demographics to build from when we advocate for the need. I recommend Congress request a Government Accountability Office report that will capture any efforts of both state mental health and child welfare agencies that address the needs of children of parents with serious mental illness. The report should include what data states are currently collecting, research or other studies agencies have commissioned or are aware of, including experts in their state, and any programs or services, including evidence-based practices supporting foster children of parents with serious mental illness. After the GAL report identifies any existing infrastructure, Congress should create a grant through the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, SAMHSA, to develop data and research for the creation of evidence-based practices to serve the unique needs of foster children of parents with serious mental illness. Please help me raise awareness for this highly vulnerable yet forgotten population of foster children so that we can target services to those who need it most. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Carrie Richman, and the first five years of my life were defined by physical and sexual abuse as I went in and out of the foster system. Desperate for a family, I was ecstatic when I was told I would be adopted. But it was too good to be true, and sexual abuse continued in my adoptive family. My fear of being placed back in the foster system and losing the family that I finally had kept me from telling anyone about the abuse. Shortly after my adoption, my parents divorced and I moved away from my abuser. I felt lost and alone as I kept the secret bottled up inside me. But when I began school, I got involved with extracurricular activities and found mentors in clubs, organizations, and sports. Participating in these activities gave me a sense of belonging, access to a support system who constantly encouraged me and restored my trust in adults. Without these relationships, I would not be where I am today, a 21-year-old college student moving towards success. I know this is because of the mentors who encouraged me, supported me, and helped me believe in myself. But all foster youth do not have the same access to supportive adults and opportunities to grow through extracurricular activities. Foster youth across the country continue to struggle with challenges such as early pregnancy, incarceration, and substance abuse. These outcomes result in federal spending on Medicaid and welfare programs, adding up to $300,000 per foster youth who ages out of the system. With 26,000 young people aging out each year, this means $7.8 billion is being spent federally. That's a lot of money. This is the cost of doing nothing. We must take action to improve the lives of these foster children. We must encourage them that they are not a product of their past and that they have bright futures. 
The Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act, enacted last Congress, acknowledges the importance of extracurricular activities for foster youth. The law requires states to implement a reasonable and prudent parent standard, giving foster parents the authority to allow foster youth to participate in activities deemed safe and age appropriate. This was great, but there are still gaps to be filled, such as making sure that funds are available for all age groups to participate in extracurricular activities. This is why I recommend that members of Congress send a letter to their states and districts encouraging them to allocate funds specifically for foster children to participate in extracurriculars. The letter should indicate what funds are available and encourage states to raise awareness among child welfare agencies and foster families of these funds. My second recommendation is an amendment to the Social Impact Partnership Act. This act has recently been introduced to Congress to encourage partnerships that would enable states, nonprofits, and the federal government to partner with the private sector to utilize philanthropic and other investments to improve certain outcomes. Congress should amend the Social Impact Partnership Act to include programs and organizations that improve outcomes for foster youth as a result of healthy adult relationships through age-appropriate and extracurricular activities. The cost of implementing these recommendations would be an investment in the future of foster youth. Giving these kids access to supportive adults and opportunities to grow through extracurricular activities will increase the positive outcomes of our nation's foster youth. Because of my experiences, I believe that the real cost of providing opportunities for this country's foster youth is priceless. Thank you. Jerry, great job. Thank you. <laughs> So this has got to be the most distinguished panel that has ever assembled, uh, maybe in this room, but certainly for the uh, Congressional Adoption uh, Caucus. So thank you all for being here. And I only got to hear two of the presentations. But one was from Kerry, so that was particularly uh, <laughs> important for me. And uh, we brought a bunch of the Team Portman people here to see you today. Um, we're really proud of Kerry. She's done a great job as an intern. and. She's not only done a terrific job, as uh, many interns do, but she's brought a unique perspective. She just talked about it. And uh, it's, um, it's a perspective that we need to hear. Uh, she talked about two specific issues, the uh, extracurricular activities and encouraging that and supporting that through federal legislation and also the social impact partnership programs. But she's also been involved with us on a number of other issues, uh, including the human trafficking issue and uh, child welfare issues generally, and foster care generally. And uh, thanks to Carrie, we have now taken a special interest in and are working on legislation that encourages uh, higher ed institutions to ensure that young people who have aged out of the foster system have somewhere to go during holidays when the dorms are shut down. And frankly, we never would have gotten into that issue but for you. Thank you. So how old are you? 21? 21. I mean, when I was 21, <laughs> it certainly wasn't influencing legislation. <laughs> um, seriously, um, you, you've been terrific, and I'm sure the same goes for uh, all of you in your internships, that you've been able to bring a certain experience and a certain point of view that has enriched those offices and, and helped with regard to specific legislative activities. You mentioned the, the legislation we did get enacted. Uh, that provide some assistance uh, to foster care and to kids who are in the foster care system who are particularly vulnerable to trafficking. Uh, that's certainly going to continue to be a big focus of our office. And uh, again, I, I appreciate the fact that you brought that, that perspective to bear. Um, good luck back at Kent State. We're, we're, we're going to miss you. Uh, but I know you'll continue to stay in touch with us, right? And Carrie has also been involved in a group called Together We Rise, which is a nonprofit that does a lot of work in this area. And um, I know that you'll continue to help encourage us uh, at the federal level as well as the state level to, to make a difference. So to the Adoption Coalition, thanks for holding this conference today and this opportunity for all of us to hear from uh, this distinguished panel that um, brings special insights. Um, and Godspeed to each of you. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is
is Destiny Reed and I'm a rising junior at East Carolina University in North Carolina. And this summer I had the amazing opportunity to work in Senator Stabenow's office. Hey, Jerry. <laughs> um, when you hear the word adoption, what do you typically think of? When I hear the word adoption, I think back to the placement that me and my two brothers had to go through. At the age of nine, my two brothers and I were adopted into a home that we thought that we would be with forever. After about three months, the honeymoon stage started to wear off, and I started to see a different side of my new family. The change was not immediate, but it was gradual. The more children that came into the home, the more aggressive the placement got. During this time, I felt as though I had no one to turn to for help. After the adoption was finalized, I, ha I experienced some of the worst mental, physical, and emotional pain that I had up until that point in my life. Sexual and physical abuse became the norm for a few of the girls in the home, and during this hard time, one of the children in the home went to the teacher and told about what was happening. The very same night that the girl went and told, um, we were all taken out of our placement, out of the adoptive home, and put back into foster care. The very, um, adoption disruption is when an adoption ends before it is legally finalized, and adoption dissolution is when an adoption ends after it is legally finalized. Through my personal experience, I believe that no, not only Congress, but the community as a whole needs to better understand adoption disruption and dissolution. The Preventing Sex Trafficking and Strengthening Families Act of 2014 included national data tracking for dissolved adoptions. Although this was amended, there have not been any actions taken on the data that is collected and what should be done with the information once the data is tracked. My, my recommendation to Congress would be to amend the current law to further require states to report the reason for the dissolution, how long it took for the adoption to finalize, the length of the adoptive placement, the agency that is responsible for the placement, and whether or not the child has siblings and the status of the child after the, after the dissolved adoption. Amending this act would invest time into data tracking that would analyze and improve the federal law and help prevent further trauma to children in care, as well as increase the number of successful adoptions. Adoption disruption and dissolution are not a topic of general discussion, possibly, possibly because no one likes to anticipate a failed adoption. There have been many small-scale studies done that show that adoption disruption and dissolution needs to be addressed, but there is no national survey of data. A data, a data study done in 1993 shows the adoption disruption and dissolution ranged from 3 to 5 percent, while another study done in 2006 showed it um, increasing to 10 to 25 percent. That's almost twice as much in less than 15 years. Although this sounds like a small number, I believe that no child should have to experience the promise of a forever home and then have that taken away from them. The need to find preventative measures to ensure that an adoption does not fail is needed. Again, I recommend that Congress amend the law to reflect the need for better adoption dissolution preventions. Thank you. The roots of a tree are the foundation of its life. A healthy foundation produces strong branches. For many foster youth, their roots have not experienced a solid foundation. Good afternoon, my name is Jen Aleen, and I am a former foster youth from the state of Tennessee, and I have a passion for getting to the root of things. In the case of a foster youth, it's a it is critical to get to the root and to establish a strong foundation by providing mental health services such as therapeutic counseling. These services provide an essential foundation of stability that supports all of their, all other aspects of human development, including the formation of relationships, the ability to cope with adversity, and the achievement of success in future endeavors. As for myself, I experienced a traumatic upbringing that I believe could have been mitigated with early assessment and treatment. When I was in foster care, I refused mental health services due to fear, stigma, and lack of understanding of how important therapeutic services could have helped me. As a result, I experienced depression, social anxiety, and an obsessive compulsive disorder which prevented me from living my fullest potential. My conditions led to unemployment, legal issues, and homelessness. Individually, any one of these problems could hinder any young adult's efforts to build a successful life. For foster youth to receive services, they must first be screened to identify potential issues. The Administration for Children and Families is responsible for mon monitoring state foster care programs to ensure these requirements are met. 
However, a 2015 Office of Inspector General report found that ne nearly a third of foster care children in foster care who were enrolled in Medicaid did not receive at least one required health screening. As a result, 75 to 80 percent of these children were not receiving needed mental health services due to states not complying with current requ requirements for screenings. Screenings are the first step to ensuring youth receive the mental health services they need. According to the Center for Health Care Strategies, among states, there is a large variance of time frames for providing initial and comprehensive mental health screenings. Almost one-fourth of states do not have a time requirement for health screenings, whereas the remaining states have time limits that range from one day to 90 days. Consistent time limits would help ensure states provide screenings and treatment for youth. The health care needs of this population remain complex and today access to and coverage access to and coverage of comprehensive, timely, and appropriate health care services remain key issues for children in foster care. It is time for these issues to be examined and addressed at a federal level. Although each state is required under the Social Security Act to establish a plan of ongoing oversight and coordination, it is clear that foster youth are not receiving mental health screenings and treatment. To address this, I propose amending the Social Security Act to require initial mental health screenings within 30 days of a child of youth entering foster care. Following their initial screening, they should receive recommended services within 30 days of the initial screening. Finally, I propose that youth receive a comprehensive mental health screening within 30 days, sorry, 90 days of entering the foster care system and at least once a year after they enter care. Foster youth have just as much as potential as any person. There are higher risks and challenges they face, but with proper care and treatment, these youth can build a healthy foundation not only for themselves, but for their future families. Thank you. Hello, and thank you all. On behalf of all the foster youth interns, I would like to thank you all so much for taking time out of your day to hear our recommendations for improvements on the foster care system. We hope that our recommendations will serve as great reference points as we all create and amend laws in order pr to promote effective change and solutions. Through teamwork, we can accomplish milestones. A wise man once said, it always seems impossible until it's done. And thank you all so much for coming. At this time, we'd like to open it up to the audience for questions. Any questions? Yes, in the back. This question is for Angelique. Um, what is the role of an educational vocational specialist and how does it differ from a social worker? Thank you for your question. So, oftentimes social workers are given a big caseload. So, they have a big caseload which equals a lot of field work and paperwork, not really being able to cater to the educational needs of foster youth. And they're also not always aware of the resources that are available and the policies that are in place that cater to foster youth. So that's why there needs to be a specific person in charge of, an, of a youth's education. That way they know the policies that are already in place, the resources that are available to youth, and for them to have a dialogue between one another with that child to um, you know, talk to them about the things they're interested in what things they like, what things they don't like, are you having trouble in a class? For example, my educational vocational specialist assessed my um, records and she saw that I was having a problem in math. So we spoke about it and I told her I was having a problem in math and then from that point on we worked on getting a tutor for me and it was smooth sailing. So yeah, thank you. Thank you Angelique. Any other questions? We have time for two more. Okay. If there's no further questions, I'd like to bring up the Congressional Coalition on Adoption Institute's Executive Director, Becky Warnhand. Thank you so much. You guys are fantastic. Um, CCI's mission is to raise awareness about the children in the United States and around the world who are living outside of families. 
and the many ranges of issues um, that they face. So the Foster Youth Internship Program is exactly doing that, and all of our work, we try to bring expertise and experience to members of Congress and federal policymakers so that they have the full um, experience uh, of youth voice or the, the people who are involved in how the systems and policies are impacting their lives. And someone told me last year, when they heard one of our um, Foster Youth Intern alumni speak, that it is right and good to have foster youth at the table when we're talking about federal policy on foster care. And I totally agree. And um, these interns have worked so hard all summer long, and we are just so proud of them. And so I wanted to first, um, in a list of thank yous, acknowledge the 2015 foster youth interns, Angelique, Ashley, Brienne, Serena, Destiny, Eric, Janessa, Kenya, Carrie, Lindsay, Marcia, and Matthew for their hard work throughout one of the most rigorous internship programs in Washington, D.C., and you know that's true. <laughs> we reflect on all that you guys have overcome, on all of your accomplishments, um, not only today, but throughout your lives. And we um, just want to pause and reflect on your courage to share your stories, and knowing that you care so much about improving the lives of the youth and children in care who are coming behind you. So we're, we're really grateful that you guys entrusted us with your stories. And I also wanted to just reflect on the fact that you guys are now published authors, which is so exciting. And um, we also wanted to make sure that those of you who didn't have time to ask questions know that there's a more in-depth analysis in the written reports that you received when you came in. And that will also be available electronically on our website in the future as well. Um, we, of course, want to thank all those members of Congress who came and joined us today. Senators Weidman, Portman, Blunt, Scott, and Representatives Franks and Mullen. Um, and then I just, Ashley was so right to kind of go into that list of thank yous, because a, a program like this um, really cannot be accomplished without the support of many individuals and organizations really throughout the year. So what you're seeing today is the culmination of days and weeks and months of um, incredibly um, good work. And so I want to acknowledge some of those people briefly. So first of all, with the CCI Board of Directors, specifically, we are honored to have three of them with us today, Jack Gerard and Russ Sullivan, and <laughs> We also want to acknowledge this, the role of the CCAI Advisory Council, and some of those members you've heard from today, Senator Blunt and Representative Franks, um, and then we also have Gary Newton here with us, and Lindsay Ellenbogen. And we also have all the Sarah Start Fund mentors here as well, and so we're really grateful for your support of the interns. We also want to thank our, um, our sponsors, our partner organizations. So um, we have Platinum sponsors, the American Petroleum Institute, and Chevron Corporation. And then we have the 2015 Foster Youth Internship Sponsor Circle, who are directly investing in the lives of these foster youth, alumni, and those in care. The Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, Jackie Bean Family, the Community Foundation for Northern Capital Region, Carnival Foundation, Carrie and Scott Hasenbog, and Laura and Doug Wheat. And then we also want to acknowledge our gold partners, Casey Family Programs, the Cruise Industry, Charitable Foundation, Floor Corporation, and Henry and Lindsay Ellenbogen. There are also some special friends of the Foster Youth Internship Program here in the room that we wanted to acknowledge. Um, Barb Walzer. She's represented here and we're really grateful for her support as well. Ashley Davenport and Christina Weger. And of course the Child Welfare Team at the Congressional Research Service for their support throughout the summer. Deserving the greatest acknowledgement would be um, the small but mighty CCI staff who have invested their professional and personal time. Um, they've also given a lot of, just a lot of sacrificially throughout the summer um, to support the interns and get to know them um, and invest in them. And so please hold your applause. I know you all love them, but I'm going to ask you to hold your applause until I read all of their names so that we can acknowledge them together. 
Allison Coble, our Senior Director of Programs, who oversees the Boston Internship Program. Kristen Glickman, our Director of Policy, who oversaw the process of the legislative policy report writing, which was a big undertaking. Taylor Drady, Policy and Programs Associate. Misty Miller, our Director of Operations. And Martina Arnold, our Director of Development. So I wanted to acknowledge the staff. That marks the closing of yet another Foster Youth Internship Congressional Briefing, and we want to invite you all. We have refreshments and a reception that will follow. We'll be joined by a few other members of Congress, so we would, of course, welcome for you to come up and uh, greet the interns, and if you have any follow-up questions for them, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much for joining us today.